okay? So before I had enough fellowship, I had to shake my hand.
thank you very much. Do you have that recorded or is that anywhere? Is it like on iTunes and things of that nature? It is. I know about a thousand people that need that song. I'm going to find out how to get it. Because I want people to hear that. Your story's not over. And that's powerful. Thank you, sir. And I look forward to tonight. I can't wait for that. We have a chat, so uh, that's my first time I've addressed you. So welcome, Brent. I'm glad you're here. And, uh, and thank you for that. I, I must warn y'all, I woke up this morning and I did not have coffee. <laughs> and so we are, I, we're spoiled people in America. I'm just going to tell you, we're spoiled. I, I'm spoiled. And so since I didn't have coffee, Lori and I are leaving the house this morning. I pull out my app because that's how we work things today. And I have a mobile ordering option where I can order my coffee. And I got my, I'm going to use a word here, y'all be careful. I got my spiked today. <laughs> the only way to spike coffee is to add shots of espresso to it. And I clicked order, and we took off from the house. And so we went by there, and people are waiting on their drinks and all that, where they're ordering all these coffees, and I walk right in, and mine's waiting on the counter. I grab them and I walk out. And about halfway down here, Lori looks at me, because we're talking theology, we're talking just practical stuff, we're doing all kinds of stuff, and she looked over there, and said, like, slow down, that coffee's taking effect. <laughs> so I just want to warn you, number one, I've had spiked coffee on the way down here. And number two, I don't get to preach tonight, so I'm going to get it to you this morning. <laughs> now, that, we're going to have fun tonight, I know. But uh, listen, let me share this with you before we start. If you have a Bible, go ahead and uh, turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to continue this series of messages uh, called Tools of the Trade. If you have not been here to present these messages before, we're kind of right in the middle of these. It doesn't mean you're going to be lost. I hope, I hope that uh, today will be. Uh, as encouraging, as equipping and uplifting as, as any other one would be. But as you turn there, I was thinking as we were singing, as Luis were, uh, was leading us in these songs, and then as Brandon shared, you know, again, I must tell you this. A couple things. Number one, and this is not the sermon yet, so don't start your clocks yet. Um, we live in unprecedented times today in America, okay? And when I say that, that part is not encouraging at all. These are very difficult days and times that God has called us to live in and navigate. All right? Difficult beyond belief. I don't think any of us would have imagined just a few short years ago we would be in the condition of our, in our country that we are today. But the second thing I would tell you is this. When I hear songs like that again, and I realize what the Lord's given me uh, for you today in this series of messages called Tools of the Trade, there is no better time to be alive right now. There is no better time to call yourself a disciple of Christ. There's no better time to call yourself a Christian, a believer, a follower. Because in the midst of such unprecedented times uh, that are around today, the light that is God that God has brought into this room today, when I say the light, the light that He's called you to be, and that He will shine through you. Listen, my friend, there's no better time, and I cannot wait to share these other things with you this morning, no better time to be alive, no reason to be afraid, no reason to be fearful and just wringing your hands and going, okay, God, I don't know what to do today. This is a wonderful, wonderful time to call yourself a Christ follower and to live out the Christian faith that God has planted inside of you through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no better time. And this is one of the reasons why I love going through this passage, because as I've shared with you before, again, just in way of review, that I believe there's no higher calling in your life than where you are right now. It doesn't matter where you are right now. I would believe, I believe that I can convince you, if you're not convinced already, that there is no higher calling on your life than there is right now. There might be different callings one day. There might be different places to go and people to serve and, and things to do, okay? But for now, right where you are, God has you exactly where He wants you to be for His purposes, for His glory. And I just want you to believe that. And so as people uh, really believe that and we read the Scripture and understand that God is doing a great work and wants to do a great work for each of us, the question comes back to then, how do I do it? This is why we come to the book of Galatians. Stand, if you will, so that we can read the Scripture. And we're going to talk about another one of these fruits. Uh, it's really just one fruit, nine different 
expression, but also <coughs> all those things, the tools of the trade. In Galatians chapter 5, beginning, let's just again go back to verse 16 first. And this is what the Bible says. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And then go down to verse 22, and we'll read through verse 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank You again for the fact that You have chosen us at this particular time in all of history to be alive here in this great country that we call home in the United States of America. And Lord, again, as we survey the happenings of our day, the situations that we find ourselves in, Lord, we, we are oftentimes scratching our head, wondering how in the world this happened. Father, sometimes we find, our, our, we find ourselves angry over what's happening in our day. Lord, sometimes we find ourselves worried and anxious, depressed even, and wondering what in the world is going to happen. Father, I pray that today you would infuse us again with an excitement about where you have placed us. Lord, an enthusiasm. Lord, that you would encourage us today with the fact that you have chosen to put us here at this time in all history to be your warrior, to be your servant. And Lord, with such tools as kindness that we're going to look at today, wondering how in the world can kindness be such a wonderful tool. Lord, would you open up our minds and hearts today to the wonderful truths of just how much you have equipped us for this time in our day. We love you, Lord, and we open our hearts and minds to you now as you can speak to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Over the last four weeks, we've addressed the first four of these nine expressions of the fruit of the Spirit that uh, is supposed to be evident through the believer, through the follower of Christ. We looked at love, and as we looked at love, and finally we said that, that love is seeing and needed meeting it. It's knowing the price and paying it, and it's not talking yourself out of it. We looked at the tool of joy, and we realized that joy is that permanent state that the Christian has where we can look beyond our, our current situation. And joy is found when we participate in the work of God. If you remember, if you were here that day, you remember I said that coming to church is not participating in the work of God. Participating in the work of God means so much more than just coming to church. And this is one reason why so many Christians are not experiencing the joy of their salvation if we just come to church and we just go home and we're not participating and getting involved in things that are so much bigger than us as we do the work of the Lord that we are not going to be experiencing joy. That joy also includes the investment in other people. So that requires a lot on our part if we want to invest our lives in other, in other people. Love and joy, we talked about peace and how without the peace of God in our lives, in us, we're not going to have the peace of God working through us. And that means we've got to know Christ first and foremost. And secondly, then the peace of God working through us to be at peace with others is a very important tool. Last week we talked about patience, okay? If you remember, if you were here last week, uh, I said my goal last week was to have you pray for patience by the time we were done, okay? Because everybody says, don't pray for patience, okay? Now, I tried to state the case that there's a, there's, if, that's the, if that's how you're going to live, then you cannot pray for these other things as well, okay? Because if you pray for love, God's going to put around you unlovable people, all right? If you pray to be more forgiving, God's going to put around you unforgiving people or unforgivable things, okay? And so whenever you pray for any of these things, God's going to put you in a scenario or around people or things that's going to cause you to have to learn these things. And so if you were here Sunday morning and Sunday night, I think it was somewhere around, I gave you 14 reasons to pray for patience between the morning and the evening. And one of the biggest ones for me was this. When I look at the result of a patient person versus an impatient person, I'd rather look like this over here. 
I'd rather look like and sound like a patient individual than what it looks and sounds like to not be patient. The next one on our list today is kindness, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. Now, we understand the Greek word that means kindness here. There's some other words it means as well. And it can also mean helpfulness, benevolence, or friendliness, or kindness. Okay? Now, some people have said that kindness is agape with legs on it. Okay? In other words, kindness is so much more than just a feeling. Okay? Kindness is as active as anything if you have given yourself to this fruit of the Spirit. When your heart is motivated to seek the benefit of other people, then you will naturally want to find ways to bless them. And whenever you practice kindness, you are a blessing to those around you. And you know of people that you can think of right now who are kind. All right? You know who they are in your life. I know who they are in my life. I want to be more like that person. Because you can see in that person more than just a feeling the kindness that they offer you is in uh, tangible ways, and you can see it, and you can feel it yourself. I have to warn you that just like the previous four, that kindness is not natural. Okay? This kind of, of word, being helpful and benevolent and friendly, this does not come natural to us as humans. Again, you know why? Because there's one thing that gets in the way very easily in me every day, and it is me. Okay? I get in my own way every day because I am selfish. Okay? That's what the flesh cries out for itself to be uh, magnified more than anyone else. And so every day we wake up and we begin our day, we begin to think of ourselves first. This is one of the reasons why kindness is not natural. And it requires the power of the Spirit of God working through us and us yielding to the Spirit. This is why we read these uh, verses to live in step with the Spirit, okay, is required for these things to happen. You have to look for opportunities to be kind. You have to be wanting to look for these opportunities. If you have your Bibles open to Galatians, just turn to the right uh, a few pages over to Philippians chapter 4. Excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, verse number 4. Philippians 2, verse 4 says this, Each of you should look. If you underline words, or if you highlight words in your scripture, then this is one of them. Each of you should look, not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, if you want to be kind today, if you want kindness to be working through you, you have to reorient yourself and you have to begin to look beyond your own interests and begin to look toward the interests of others. In other words, you need to develop a radar and begin to watch and to take in the things that you see. And you need to begin to listen and take in the things that you hear and be able to pick up on the hints. And you need to ask questions. You need to develop this kind of a sensory approach to life or else you're not going to be kind. If you don't wake up every day and begin to look for opportunities to, to, to demonstrate kindness, you're not going to. Okay? If you're not developing that radar and those senses being heightened in that way, it's just not going to happen. In fact, if you're in Philippians 2, go to your right, just a couple more pages, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and look beginning there at verse number 12. Okay? Colossians 3, verse 12 says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, these next two words, clothe yourselves. Clothe yourselves, it says, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In other words, you have to wake up every day and clothe yourselves with these things, including kindness. You have to be purposeful in order to be kind to others. Now, I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, I clothe myself. Okay? And aren't you glad? We all do that. We don't wait until after lunch to clothe ourselves. We don't wait until late in the afternoon. We don't wait until mid-morning. 
We do that right away. And so we must be very purposeful at the beginning of our day to clothe ourselves, to put on these things, because if we are not, then it's just not going to happen. These things just don't take place in our lives because there's something that gets in the way of me. And you're looking at me. I keep getting in the way of myself unless I am purposeful. Write this down because I'm just going to quote the first half of it. Proverbs 11, 17 says, A kind man benefits himself. A kind man benefits himself. He goes on to say that a cruel man brings trouble on himself. But I love that a kind man benefits himself. I want you to join with me now for the next few moments. We're going to do kind of a quick survey, if you will, in Scripture of kindness. We don't have time to address everything that the Bible tells us about kindness. We need several weeks for that, I believe. But I want to give you a quick survey, if you will. Okay, like when we were in seminary, we would take a survey of the Old Testament or a survey of the New Testament. And then other classes, you, you pick a particular book and those kinds of things. This is going to be kind of like a survey. And so we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament law to begin with to talk about kindness. Then we're going to look at some things that Jesus says about kindness. And then we're going to close with the things that Paul says about kindness. So if you have your Bible, go all the way back, if you will, to one of those great books that I know you love to read, the Book of Leviticus. Okay? <laughs> One of the books of the law, Leviticus chapter 19, okay? I'm going to give you, I'm going to really look at three different passages. I'm going to try to keep moving quickly, okay, so we can get through everything in a reasonable amount of time. But in Leviticus chapter 19, let's look at the first one, and then we'll go to a couple others. Beginning in verses 9 and 10. Okay, this is an agricultural type of illustration, but you will get it. Leviticus 19, 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm sure I don't have to repaint this picture with you. You're smart enough. But if you have a field, here's what the law says. If you have sown your seed from corner to corner to corner to corner of your field, and you go out and it's now harvest time, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament law that if you're on your tractor, they didn't have tractors there, you know, we do today, there's no way you can go to this corner. Why? If you do, you have to stop back up. Okay, you're going to round off, right? And so you're not going to hit everything over here in this corner because you've got to round it off. And then you get to that corner, you've got to round and from corner to corner, you're going to round off. Here's what the Bible's saying. Don't go back to the edges. Don't go back to those corners. All right? I have blessed you with an abundance. And you take all of that. And then he says, don't go over the second time. Okay? It's what the Scripture says. Don't go over the second time. Because just in case something was missed, you leave it there. And then when you have piled it all into your, into your wagons and all into your Bats and all that, and you're driving back into your barn and you're hitting the bumps and all the, 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 the rough edges and, and, and spilling off the side in your abundance. Don't go back for it. Why? Because there are poor in your neighborhood, there are poor in your world that are watching you from the woods, okay, hoping, hoping that they can have something, and that's your way of saying, come on, come get what's left. You go to these corners. You go to what fell off the truck. You go to whatever we missed the first time. And in this way, you are kind to those who just don't have. Now, I don't have any fields today. Okay? I don't, I don't harvest my fields. But you know what? The Lord has been good to us. The Lord has blessed Lori and myself. The Lord has always given us everything that we need. And there are times, there's plenty of times, plenty of times, where we have extra. Everybody with me? I mean, I know everybody wants a little bit more. Okay? I get all of that. Uh, and, and, and so we have to fight that. But you know what? There are times where we just have extra. And it's just time. You know what? Don't even count it. Don't even worry about it. Let others who are in need at that point in time have it. Some of my best friends and myself all were dating all the way back to seminary. To this day, we made it a rule. We do not loan each other money. We just don't do it. We get it. 
If someone's at lunch and we meet and we have that and we realize, whoops, they forgot something, they don't have it, we give it. Okay? There's none of this loan and business in, in our world. And so that's one of the very first ways to be kind. And really, that's a passive kind of kindness because you just you're letting others just have what you what you have. If you're still in Leviticus 19, go to verses 33 and 34. And this is what we read. It says, When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself for. You were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now listen, this is not meant to raise a debate in our country over illegal aliens. Don't, 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 don't hear any of that, okay? I, I, I'm a man who believes that as, as, as a nation of laws, it's one of the things that sets us apart from the living world, okay? So don't necessarily try to misinterpret anything I'm saying. Here's what I am saying, though. If you come across an alien, an illegal alien, on the street, or in your town, or wherever we are, the Bible says you treat them well. Okay? That's what the Bible says. Because it reminds them, it says, oh yeah, just remember this, you used to be aliens in Egypt, and I heard you cry, and we got you out. So the Bible tells us to be very kind, um, and, and, and to treat the others, it says, as yourself. How would you like to be treated? How would you like to be treated? That's how the Bible says to treat others when we see them. Go over to the book of Deuteronomy, to the right, several pages. Deuteronomy chapter 22. What else does the scripture say to us in the law about being kind? I really think y'all, y'all get this, y'all understand this. This is a, this is just an affirmation I would be looking there for. For the vast, vast majority of you. Beginning in verse number one of Deuteronomy 22, this is what we read. If you see your brother's ox or sheep straying, do not ignore it, but be sure to take it back to him. If the brother does not live near you, or if you do not know who he is, take it home with you and keep it until he comes looking for it. Then give it back to him. Do the same if you find your brother's donkey or his cloak, or anything he loses, do not ignore it. If you see your brother's donkey or his ox fall off the road, do not ignore it. Help him get it to its feet. In other words, when you see anybody in need, which is what we looked at back in the Good Samaritan uh, with the very first one called love, then help them with whatever that need is. If you see is how it started. So if you see something, what are you going to do? Stop what you're doing. Okay? That means you interrupt your day. You interrupt your schedule. You interrupt all the expectations that are on you because why? Being kind to that other person is more important than keeping your own schedule. Okay? And that's what the Scripture tells us. Now let's go back and see uh, some of the things that Jesus had to say about kindness. Go to the book of Matthew, if you will. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. And let's get, again, look at something very familiar to you. Beginning in verse, let's, let's just start at verse 34. Okay? Verse 34 of Matthew 25. This is what the Bible says. that the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then notice this, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the, say it with me, least of these, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. 
Here's one of the things you have to understand about kindness. When God has presented you an opportunity because you have looked, you have listened, you have discerned, because it's plain as day, kindness is required at this time. When you serve that person in kindness, who are you serving? The Lord Jesus Christ Himself. You are serving Him. It is your call. It is, your, it is not maybe you should do that. This is a command of ours that we are called to do this. Now, still in the book of Matthew, go back to Matthew <coughs> chapter 5 for just a moment. And look at a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And notice one of the great purposes of our acts of kindness in this passage, okay? Matthew chapter 5, pick it up in verse number 13. Jesus is preaching this phenomenal sermon. He says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Then he goes on, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Okay, now think about this. He says, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. In other words, your acts, your actions, there's no way to hide this. There's no way it should be hidden. It should be evident to all, okay? And he goes on in verse 15, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, here it is, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do you know the result of your good deeds? Do you know the result of your kindness? They are going to see, the world is going to see, because this can't be hidden, okay? It's not meant to be hidden, all right? But when they see your good de deeds, who gets praised? God the Father, not you. God the Father gets praised. And if any praise comes to you, what do you do with it? You are to deflect it right back up to the Father and say, it's only because the Holy Spirit is working in me and through me that I can do any of these things. So all praise goes to Him. One other quick thought about what Jesus says. Go to the, about the Go to the book of Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Notice what the Scripture tells us in these verses. Oh, hurry on, hurry on. Luke 6, beginning in verse number 32. Notice what Jesus tells us. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be paid in full. But, and here comes the hinge. He says, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because He is kindly, ungrateful, and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Your kindness, my kindness, as we give it one to another, even lost people do that. Even those who don't have a relationship with God do that. They know how to do that. Jesus says it's time then to take your acts of kindness to even to your enemies, to those who do not like you, and present to them acts of kindness. We need, to be a, we, we need to raise ourselves to a, to a higher standard. Not just we're more in our kind of each other, but we're kind of those that we don't even know. That's what the Scripture calls us to do. I think what Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, where he says, don't grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, I think the great difference in those who grow weary in giving up is this. If your kindness it's just a series of activities to prove to others you're a Christian, you'll grow weary and give up. If you're just doing things because you feel like, okay, I've got to prove that I'm a Christian now, I've got to be kind to others who don't even like me, then you're going to grow weary and you are going to give up. But when your acts of kindness is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that comes from deep within you in a deep abiding love, healthy relationship with God, you won't grow a spirit. You, you, you might grow weary, but you won't give up. That's the difference in your acts of kindness. Kindness is the lens through which others perceive 
and experience love. Kindness grows trust. Kindness breaks down barriers. Kindness loosens chains. Kindness softens hearts. Kindness draws and attracts the isolated out of isolation into relationships. And kindness builds attachments. And kindness strengthens bonds. I want to share with you one other thing from the scripture. And that is what Paul has to say about kindness. Now again, these are just some this is just a survey, okay, so there's no way to touch on everything here. But if you would, go to uh, the book of Titus, if you will. Go to the book of Titus. Go past 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and then you come to Titus. And if you come to Titus chapter 3, I want to remind you of something else here. <coughs> Titus chapter 3. Look at just this one verse with me, if you will, for now. And that is verse number 3. You are being addressed, okay, by the Apostle Paul. God is addressing you through the Apostle Paul in this one verse. He says, at one time we too, we be who? Us. We too were full of foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We live in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. There was a time. No one is born a Christian. That's why you have to be born what? Again. Okay? No one is born a Christian. There's a time. There was a time for many of you that you fit in this same category. You were foolish. I was foolish. Okay? Disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all passions and all the desires and pleasures that this world had to offer. We live in such things as malice and envy, hating and being hated. Does that not sound like our day to day? Hating and being hated, living in malice, giving ourselves to all kinds of pleasure. This is what the world does today. But then notice verse number four. It says, but when the what? Say it. Some, some, some of them say mercy. My translation says kindness. Same, same thing. They're, they're interchangeable. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. But when the kindness, okay, and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us out of all that. Not because, it says, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Listen, my friends, this is kindness. This is kindness. You want to sum it up in one word? It's called forgiveness. When we realize that God's kindness showed up, instead of His judgment upon my life, which couldn't happen, His kindness showed up and His love saved me, why? Not because of all these good things I did, but because of His mercy, because of His love, because of His grace, just because He loved me beyond all the things I did. His kindness is what generated that. His mercy was demonstrated to me for that. That is what God's called us to do. This is why. This is the greatest day in the world to be alive. This is why I pray every day, okay, Lord, if, 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 if I'm not going to die today, would you keep me healthy? Keep me healthy for a long time because I want to spread this message. This is what people need to hear. This is a message of kindness. Listen to this little story. And then we'll, I'll try to wrap it up. Back in the early 90s, uh, this cosmetic company, I'll leave them name, sponsored a promotion where people, they sent letters and pictures, okay? Supposedly to say, okay, this picture, this letter is my nomination for the most beautiful woman in the world. Okay? As you can imagine, thousands of these pictures with the letters, supporting documentation with the picture, came in to say, this is the most beautiful woman I know. There was one that came in and, and it particularly captured a lot of attention and they brought it to the president, okay, uh, of the company. And this is what the letter said. This is some of what the letter said. It says, a beautiful woman lives down the street from me. She lets me visit her every day. She makes me feel like I'm the most important person in the world. She plays checkers with me. 
And we talk a lot. And she listens to me. She understands me. And she tells me every day when I leave, she's proud of me. Here's her picture. <laughs> she's the most beautiful woman I know. Written by a little boy in the slums of the projects. As the president read the letter, because that's what they did first, he says, I want to see her picture. And this is what he saw. A woman who smiled with crooked teeth, well advanced in years, sitting in a wheelchair. Her hair was gray, pulled back in a bun, and wrinkles covered her face. But he did take note that her smile kind of gave a twinkle in her eye. And this is what he said to the people around him. He said, it's a good letter, but we can't use it. This is what he said. Listen to this. He said, it would show the world that our products are not necessary to be beautiful. Wow. He realized that if this were shown to the world as the winner of their contest, that their products are just obsolete, nothing needed to be this beautiful. You see, being this beautiful is not found in any product. It's not found in anything that the world would call beautiful. This kind of kindness is found in generosity, compassion, caring, in the words that we speak, in forgiveness, goodness, gentleness, love, all these things. And Jesus did it for you. And he's called on us to do it for others. You know, again, I've shared many times it's part of my story. And it was 11 years ago that I began to pray in a way because I kind of got sucker punched by a guy verbally and okay, not physically. And, and, it, and it hurt my feelings, okay? And it really made me wonder if I was a person that had the ability to have any impact whatsoever in life. I'll keep you not, 11 years ago. And upon that, I went away from that encounter. And I began to pray in ways that, and God began to open up things that I never dreamed He would. Part of it, I wish He hadn't. Okay? If you don't know what I'm trying to say there, but if you don't, we'll talk later and I'll tell you the whole story. But ever since then, I've been on a, we've been on a journey, okay, where I cannot even keep track anymore. I cannot even keep track anymore on what the Lord has done in my life in those 11 years, especially as it relates to one particular subject called suicide, okay? Now, a couple of things that I, I want to share with you as I continue to, to study this, as I continue to be, become familiar with it as much as I possibly can. I've shared some of this with Lori even this week, okay? And there's something that disturbs me here, okay? Number one, you know, some of these statistics are not out publicly yet, okay? But that they're coming because some of these statistics and numbers lag behind in the years, all right? But do you know that we have now seen the second out of the last three years, the life expectancy in America, okay, has gone down in part because of suicide. The epidemic of suicide, among other things now, but can you imagine this? In the, in the day that we live that is medically, the technology is, is phenomenal, and, 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 and understanding health, our, where we see our average lifespan just increasing and increasing on average, it has gone down now two out of the last three years because of this, okay? And then there's another term that I've become and becoming familiar with. How many of y'all know what an autopsy is? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have ever heard of a psychological autopsy? Raise your hand. Not many. Okay, when now in, in, in the wake of, of such things, these, these suicides, they've been performing what they're calling psychological autopsies, and they are gathering around because the person who is now gone, we cannot talk to them anymore. Okay, so we can't get information from them anymore. And so a psychological autopsy surrounds themselves then with everybody that knows all the kind of factors, whether it's for 
forensic and, and evidence, and then just testimonies, stories, uh, personalities of family, friends, and associates, and all that. And here's what they're finding. Are you ready for this? Okay, this is not rocket science. This is why I can understand it. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. They are finding that people are absolutely losing hope because of a lack of, say it with me, kindness. You can use other words. Other words are out there. But you, you see, again, while we have such an ability and while we live in such an incredible day, and to be alive where we as a church, we have the opportunity and the possibility to infuse hope into individuals, hope into a community, hope into a society like never before. Have you ever seen America so void of kindness? Why? We've allowed the enemy to come in and separate and divide us with hatred and discord, and we as the church have the answer to that problem, and that is to go in and blow up the world with kindness. Maybe I shouldn't use the word blow up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll scratch that. I didn't mean it like that. You know what I'm talking about? Just absolutely let ourselves explode with kindness. Do you realize what it does? It will. The Holy Spirit is constantly drawing people to Himself. Do you know what will, the, the Holy Spirit, through your kindness, will be able to draw people to Himself even more? Okay? But we as a church, if we continue to respond to the world the way the world responds to everything, we're not going to be showing them any reason to come to the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God has called us to do. You would have never dreamed, I bet, and hopefully, I don't know, you may still not, I, I may not have been that good today, that kindness would be such a powerful tool as a tool of the trade that God has given us. If we would allow the Spirit to work through us, Instead of myself. Because when I work out of myself, it's ugly, it's no good, it's worthless. And to be honest with you, I've seen it enough to know. I reflect back on it and go, ugh, that was bad. But when it's the Spirit, wow. How many of you want to walk in step in the Spirit more today than ever before? Kindness. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have any credible knowledge. You just have to have a willingness to what? Begin to look. Listen. Take it in. Clothe yourself with it every day. In other words, wake up purposely and say, I am putting this on, which means I'm going to look at this like never before. Let's pray. All right, my Father, I thank you first and foremost that, Lord, in the midst of my sin, your kindness is true. And that through your Son, Jesus Christ, your love saved me out of my sin. Not because of anything I did. Not because of any righteousness because there was no there to be found. But only because you loved me. And Father, therein is the reason for us to be kind to everyone else. Not because of anything else they do. Not because they deserve it. Not because they have a level of righteousness that I think is amazing enough that I can be kind of them, but because that love that you've shown me now lives within me and it needs to be given to them. Lord, we can see and we can talk about all kinds of epidemics in our country and, and statistics and reasons, but Father, we know today, I believe your Spirit has made it incredibly clear again through your Word, just through the, the, the knowing of our times today, that Father, kindness, kindness is so desperately needed by those who would call themselves your children. Lord, that's us. So Lord, I pray that today you would just begin to continue to work in our hearts as you have when we've talked about love, joy, peace, and patience. Lord, would you make me more kind today? And Lord, again, just like praying for patience, Father, I realize that what I've just prayed. I've just prayed that, if, Lord, if you would make me more kind, you're probably going to put in front of me opportunities, Situations and people that probably, in a lot of ways, don't deserve it. But Father, I thank you that you didn't wait for me to deserve your act of kindness towards me. Lord, may we just bury all the walls and the barriers that we've erected around us in this world in which we live and realize how evil it is and how difficult it's become in our society. The things that we see that do anger us, that do 
maybe a scratch your head and go, why, why? And I just makes us want to run. Or I pray that today you would raise up an army, a Father's Day out of Parkview Baptist Church, to be like those first responders, Lord, as I reflect back, as I look back at those towers that fell back in September of 2001. Lord, you sent. These men and women were called, and they ran back into those towers for those who were lacking hope, begging for hope, not knowing if hope was to be found. And these ran back into the disaster to bring hope. Lord, would you make us like that? Would you, Father, would you cause us as we see our world around us, as we see just the, the literal flames that are engulfing our, our nation with hatred, malice, discord, and all these things. Lord, would you cause us tomorrow, even this afternoon, Monday through Saturday, and Sunday included, run into those flames with the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ on our lips and in our hearts, extended with our hands. Father, would you do that in your church? Lord, I think the church across America desperately needs to do that. And Lord, I think again, just like you told the Israelites, remember, you were once this way in Egypt. Just like Paul told Titus, this is the way you used to be. You remember that now, because that's when God's kind of showed up to save you when you didn't deserve it, but because He loves you. Father, would you cause in us that same desire to reach out to a world that sometimes, Lord, honestly, Repulses us, makes us sick. Because we want to live holy lives and pure. We want righteousness to reign. Yes, Lord, I get all that. But Lord, what a great time to be alive. To go in the midst of all that. With kindness extended to those we see. We love you, Lord. And I pray that you do a great work in the life of your church. Even at this moment. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, right now, based on that message, I'm going to ask you to stand. Go ahead and stand with me, if you will. The is going to lead us in our final song. And I don't know if you just need to pray right where you are, okay? And if that's the case, then do it, okay? You don't have to come up here. If you feel like you need to be at the altar today, pray. You say, okay, God, I'm not a kind person. I need you to help me with kindness. Now, if you come up here and pray at the altar, I don't want you to think people are going to look at you and say, well, he's not a kind person. Because all of us need to go there because we don't follow ourselves and not going to be If you need to get saved today, if you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, would you come let me know today? Say, Mike, I'm going to be a part of this church. If this is who you are and who y'all want to be, I'm going to be a part of that. I'm going to be a part of a movement for something bigger than myself. You just be obedient to whatever God's calling you to do right now. And I would ask you to do this as you say, Lord, what are the calls of God? Let's say.
good in the proper time to leave the harvest. Let me just encourage you with something. Uh, we've talked over here before uh, the service about how passionate I am for what I do during the week and how, you know, uh, I really, what we do is we kind of front line in, in ministry, really front line. And one of the things I shared with Lori this week while we, we had a lunch one day this week, I didn't have to travel a lot, thank goodness, because I got to have to Lori one day. And uh, I just told her, this is just an honest confession, okay? Because I'm, I'm still very passionate for what I do, even when it comes to preaching the gospel, okay, on Sundays. You will grow weary, okay? You will. I told Lori that this week, I said, and I, I outlined a few things for her. I showed, I shared with her the things and who it came from and different things. I said, there are times I still just want to run. Is that okay for me to confess to y'all? I still wake up every day with passion. And I pray the Lord will never let that go. But I confessed to her this week. I said, I sometimes with all that's that's there with things or what have I just want to run. Okay? And so if you are trying to do this out of your own, you will. You will run. Okay? It is only by the Spirit living in you and working through you that you can overcome the weariness and continue on and on and on. So that I would say to you, I don't know why you come to church on Sundays, okay? I don't know why everybody comes. But I hope it's so that you can always know you're going to be rejuvenated, encouraged, refreshed, empowered by the Word of God, by the people of God, by worship, okay? Because if you're coming for any other reason, then again, if you're just trying to work out of yourself, and it's not the Spirit of God working I just want to encourage you with that. I'm looking forward to tonight. Brown, are you going to sing some more tonight? <laughs> okay, man. That's good. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad to be surrounded by talent. I don't mind being in that one spot amongst all kinds of talent. So I love it. Uh, Steve, do you have anything? Actually, I just want to remind everybody about our chicken place. And look, if you're, if you're going to be here, it's a great meal. It'll be for here or to go, however you want it. But listen, if you can't be here, we will accept donations. It's like our Sunday school lesson this morning was on Moses. And he mentioned there was a bit of a tabernacle when he had to say, Stop, we got it up. We'll let you know when to stop. <laughs>